Last lesson, science 10, biomes of the world, okay? So for biomes of the world, here's what we need to understand. A biome is an ecological region on Earth. The location of these ecological regions is determined by climatic factors, okay? Latitude, altitude, okay? Proximity to oceans, all that kind of stuff, okay? Those all affect what kind of a biome is in what area, okay? Because climate affects what kind of plants can live there, and what kind of plants live there determine what kind of animals can live there, okay? Soil is kind of a determining factor in that as well, but it's less important, okay? We're going to be going over all kinds of stuff to do with each biome, okay? So as we go through, if you find I'm accentuating anything about that particular biome, it would be advisable to highlight, underline, or somehow indicate that that section of the notes is important, okay? My expectations for you are that you need to be able to identify a biome from either a picture or a description, actually both, okay? A multiple choice question that has a picture and a description of the biome, make sure you look at both. Don't just look at the picture, okay? Look at both the picture and the description, okay? And secondly, written response item, match up the climatogram with a specific biome and justify your choice, okay? Questions on that, okay? In your notes package, I believe I have pictures of climatograms for each one, okay? Those are also included in here, so you get some idea of what you're looking for. All right, so here are the locations of the various biomes of the world, okay? And you can see, here's the equator, okay, running along the middle of the Earth where it always runs, okay? And you can see that some biomes are located only kind of 30 degrees north or south of the equator, and some are not located anywhere below that. Okay, again, we said climate is a determining factor for the location of certain biomes. Okay, anywhere where you see the bright green color, okay, that would be tropical rainforest. So obviously this is the Amazon down here in South America that would include like Brazil and places like that. Okay, we've also got a little bit over here. Okay, there's some in here in kind of the Horn of Africa. Okay, a little bit over here, some on this side of like Madagascar, that kind of area. And most of Southeast Asia, Papua New Guinea, okay, all of those kind of places are all okay, going to be tropical rainforest. Do you see any? tropical rainforest north or south of 30 degrees? No, this is an equatorial climate only, okay? It requires constant sunshine, constant suitable temperatures, and heavy rainfall, heavy, steady rainfall throughout the year. All right, next one is the savanna. It's kind of this light brown color here, all right? So there's a little bit of it in uh, in South America, not as much. Most of that is actually kind of artificial, and I don't mean like we built it, but we caused it. It's mostly by deforestation of the rainforest that this biome kind of uh, comes into being, okay? In Africa, it's very natural occurring, all right? This is where we would have, you know, so basically all of the savanna, okay, the out, or, um, like if you were going on safari, this is where you would go, okay? And you'd see lions and tigers, but not bears, okay? Um, that kind of thing in that area, okay? Everyone follow? It is, again, a tropical biome. You see very little. I mean, there's a little tiny bit of it here just outside of 30 degrees, okay? But the rest of it is all within 30 degrees of the equator, right? It's an equatorial or a tropical grassland, okay? It gets as much or more rainfall than the tropical rainforest. But a forest does not develop because the rainfall is not steady. Okay? The savanna, the rainfall comes in the monsoon season. So they get like three to four months of constant torrential rain. And then it doesn't rain a drop for six to eight months. Okay, so it's, it's a very different type of climate that gets set up there. Okay, uh, next one, desert. There's different kinds of deserts, okay? Desert, in this case, means any place that is really dry. Doesn't have to be really hot, although many of them are, okay? But big big thing here for deserts is very low rainfall. Because obviously, we do have some true desert that is north of 30 degrees. We've got all this stuff here in like Arizona, uh, Utah, northern Mexico, okay, Nevada, that kind of places, okay? Um, Obviously, the Sahara, all of the Middle East is all desert. Okay, that's a tropical dry desert for sure. Okay, uh, and then we've got the Gobi Desert right here. Okay, and that is a rain shadow desert because what's this right here? Which mountains? That's the Himalayas because that's northern India right there. That's like Tibet and all that kind of stuff. So, okay, that is definitely okay, our, um, our, our Himalayan rain shadow mountain desert. Okay, uh, it's also a very high altitude cold desert. 
right? It's not a hot desert, okay? We also see deserts here kind of by the Caspian Sea and things like that. Um, and then the outback of Australia is true desert. There's a little bit down here in Southern Africa, a little bit down at the tip of South America as well, okay? Desert can kind of appear anywhere where the conditions are right for dry weather, okay? Very, very dry weather. Okay, extreme deserts, okay? We see the color of extreme desert basically on the tops of all the tall mountain ranges, okay? Greenland, okay, a little bit here, okay? And um, what continent's missing? Antarctica, would it be all that color? Okay, all right, so uh, extreme desert, okay, would be basically just rocks, ice, very little to no plant life whatsoever. Tiana, can you let Gareth in, please? All right, um, next one we have is called chaparral, okay? Uh, we sometimes call that the Mediterranean climate. I can't imagine why. In that most of it is around the Mediterranean, okay? There are little pockets of it here and there, okay? Outside of, outside of the Mediterranean, like Southern California, um, kind of like Baja, that kind of area. Um, but um, yeah. The rest of it is pretty much all around the Mediterranean. Very hot, okay, kind of humid um, kind of climate, but it's it's definitely unique. Very different species of plants. They're like olives and, and, and things like that. Okay, great place for growing grapes and things that require like nice hot weather. Okay, temperate grassland. We sometimes call that prairie, okay, because that's where we live. Right, we're right here in the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. Okay, we've got the the temperate grassland. So this would be Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Okay, and then most of kind of Central Asia is is also uh, prairie. They call it steppe in Asia, but that would be like Mongolia and places like that would be very uh, grassland type of places. All right, there's also grassland in South America and obviously uh, in in Australia as well. Okay, what's the importance of the grasslands? What, what does the world get from there? Mm -hmm. So much of the world's food is produced in that biome, okay? Because that's where we can produce grains, which are kind of um, high intensity or high calorie foods. Okay, um, temperate deciduous forest would be this kind of minty green color there, right? And we can see that most of the Eastern United States and Southeastern Canada or central Canada, okay, uh, is that, right? So that's where we would have like our maple trees and, and things like that would grow there. Most of Europe, okay, is deciduous forest or at least was before the industrial revolution like cut it all down, okay? But uh, that's what it would have been at least naturally, okay? And we also have some of it over here kind of on the uh, uh, Western part, sorry, Eastern part of, uh, of Asia. Okay. Um, so what, what do all the trees in the deciduous forest do? Lose their leaves every year. Okay, so these are the trees that lose their leaves every year. Um, and the climate is unique in that it's it can be kind of cold. I mean, obviously, if it's in, you know, the eastern United States and in Canada, it can be cold. But the rainfall slash snowfall is steady throughout the year. You don't get lush forest, and the deciduous forest is lush, unless you have steady rainfall, okay? Tropical rainforest, same thing. It has to have the steady rainfall. Without steady rainfall, you don't get forest developing. Everybody follow there. All right, uh, the taiga, okay? The taiga is more of a, um, let's say, not so much polar, but high latitude um, kind of a biome, okay? Long, dry winters, possibly hot, dry summers as well, okay? Um, so if you go up to Fort McMurray, you're in the take, okay? Basically anything north of that, okay, until you get to the high parts of, of uh, you know, Canada, then we're looking at, uh, then we'd be looking at tundra, but, okay, the taiga is that carpet of spruce trees, okay, that you can see. If you go into Banff, into the mountains in Kananaskis, you're also in the taiga in those areas, okay? If you stand on the top of a mountain, all you see is kind of the same looking tree all the way along. Okay, that's what the taiga looks like. And there's a lot of taiga, okay? And in, in the taiga are a lot of natural resources, okay? But it is a harsh biome. There's lots of muskeg and, and, uh, and things like that. It's, it's um, mostly untouched by man, or at least until recently, simply because it is such uh, kind of a wild biome, lots of kind of large animals and things like that. Okay, and then the tundra is an Arctic grassland. It is too cold and as a result too dry to sustain any type of um, 
large plant life other than things that grow close to the ground. Okay, so grasses and mosses and lichen, okay, uh, things like that are about the only things that can grow there because winter persists for 10 months. Okay, and it's cold. Um, even in the summertime, it doesn't get very hot in, uh, in the tundra. All right, everybody getting an idea of the layout of the, of the earth in terms of those regions? Okay, so now I'm going to go into detail about each biome. Okay, anybody ever been to a place where there's tropical rainforest? Okay, I mean, if you've been to Hawaii, depending on what side of the islands, one side of the island is tropical rainforest, the other side is desert. Okay, uh, that's because of the rain shadow effect of the volcanoes. Um, but certainly if you've been to Hawaii, the, you've, you've been to uh, tropical rainforest. If you've been down to South America, most likely you've probably been in the tropical rainforest as well. Um, if you've lived most of your life in Canada, our forests are so different from a tropical rainforest. Okay, a tropical rainforest is almost unimaginably dense. Okay, our forests, if you're on the forest floor, you can see. Okay, you can see through the trees, there's spaces between them, there's not a lot of undergrowth, the trees themselves don't block a lot of light. If you're in the tropical rainforest, it's entirely different. Okay, there is a canopy, in fact, there are several canopies of trees, different layers of trees and growth. Okay, when you are on the floor of the tropical rainforest, it is considerably darker than on the forest floor in Canada because much less light gets through. Okay, and there's more undergrowth. Okay, so it's very, very dense. It's very easy to get lost okay, um, because the forest kind of closes in behind you, right? Which is why it is advisable to carry what? Yes, carry a machete. Okay, not because there's zombies or anything like that, okay, but because you can leave a trail of destruction that you can follow back. Okay, without a machete, it is very easy to get turned around. It's hard to see where the sun is. It's hard to find your direction. Okay, um, so it's yeah, it's just more dense than you can imagine. All right, so you can see here that there's the trees are also very very tall, and these are only one of the sets of trees. Okay, these are the upper canopy. There's like a middle canopy, a lower canopy, understories. There's like three layers of understory trees, and then undergrowth underneath that. All right, so general characteristics of the tropical rainforest. Okay, they're about 13% of the Earth's land surface. That number might be a little smaller now. There's been, you know, a little more development in uh, South America, so there's probably a little less. Okay, they're complex and they're variable. That's another big difference between a tropical rainforest and forest in Canada. Okay, you go into the forest in Canada and you can count on one hand the different kinds of trees in that forest. Okay, you go into the tropical rainforest and there could be hundreds of different kinds of trees. Okay, maybe even more than hundreds. Okay, um, there's no distinct seasonality. Okay, and by that, looking at the climatogram, we see that basically the temperature doesn't change. Okay, it only changes by a couple of degrees, not like it changes here, okay, where we have a swing of sometimes 50 degrees between summer and winter. Okay, um, so there's no winter, there's no summer. There might be like a, what they would call a wet and a dry season. Okay, um, if you look at the rainfall here, their wettest month is over 200 millimeters of rain. That's, that's 20 centimeters. Okay, their driest month is 15 centimeters of rain. That's their dry season. They get a lot of rain and it's steady all year round. There's no really significant dry period. Okay, um, so that's those are the kind of things. If I put a climatogram on a test and you see that basically both parts of it are flat, okay, you're probably looking at a tropical rainforest. Austin. Uh, it could be part of the description. I won't guarantee that it is. Um, I would describe, you know, vegetation and, and things like that. Okay, so we got high temperatures, high rainfall. I mean, look at the temperature here, okay? The temperature is pretty much 25 or better all the time, okay? And changes very little, okay? Uh, high humidity, okay, dominate the climate of the tropical rainforest. And you can see when you look at the mountains in the tropical rainforest, what's different between the mountains and the rainforest and mountains here? Yeah, the tops of the mountains have trees on them. The sides, the steep slopes, okay? Like this here is like a sheer cliff face and it's got stuff growing on it. It's like a chia pet, okay? Like it can just grow on every surface because the rain is constant, okay? Stuff doesn't grow on the high surfaces and steep surfaces of our mountains because the water runs off and those surfaces get baked dry by the sun, okay? Nothing's going to grow there, but it's so different here because of the large amount of rain. And you can see all the different colors of plant life in these forests as well, okay? There's all kinds of different trees, whereas when you look at the forest here, it's like, oh, so there's like 
black spruce and Engelman spruce and Douglas fir and maybe a few white spruce. That's our forest. Okay. Yeah. It's all maybe the odd like poplar in there. Okay. It's like five trees. Okay. Whereas in the tropical rainforest, much, much different. Cool. Uh, this is Hawaii. These two pictures are both Hawaii. Okay. So we got precipitation exceeding evaporation. So more water falls on the rainforest than can evaporate from the rainforest. What is that going to cause? Flooding. Flooding. Okay. The rainforest is flooded most of the year. Okay. At least six months of the year in many places. All right. In the, in the tropical rainforest, the soils, believe it or not, are very poor. There's almost no topsoil in most places. Okay. You look here. Okay. You can see the roots of the trees are exposed on the ground and the ground is like hard packed clay because, well, the, the floodwaters are constantly washing the topsoil away and all the organic material away. But the floodwaters themselves are also full of nutrients. Okay. Floodwaters, as we know, are not clear. They're murky, they're brown, they're full of sediment, okay, things like that. Well, these plants can just draw all of their nutrients out of those floodwaters. So they don't require the soil to be a source of nutrients, just an anchor. Um, decomposition is very rapid. If a tree falls in the forest, tropical rainforest that is, it makes a sound, and then in a couple of weeks it's gone, right? There's just decomposition is very, very quick for a few reasons. It's warm, it's wet. And there are tons of decomposing organisms in the rainforest that are not present here. Okay? If you don't like bugs, you should not take a vacation to the tropical rainforest because you will not enjoy yourself. There are lots and lots of bugs, many of them very big. Okay? And you generally sleep in a mosquito net. Okay? They don't just put those kind of nice white canopy looking things over beds in the tropical rainforest because they look pretty. Okay, They keep the bugs away. That's how severe the bug problem can be in those kind of places. So if you don't like bugs, you don't want to wake up with a praying mantis on your face. No, it wouldn't be cool. Okay. Um, yeah, until it jabs your eye. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, decomposition, like we said, very rapid. Okay. Intense weathering caused by high rainfall. So there's a lot of erosion. Okay. A lot of erosion, a lot of stuff getting washed away. Okay. That causes the near total removal of all soluble nutrients from the soil. But then of course they are in the water. Okay. And they're often low in calcium and potassium because those are very soluble materials and they dissolve easily in the water. Okay, so looking at a soil profile, I've actually shown you this picture before, okay, but in the tropical rainforest, the soil profile looks like this. Top soil is thin to absent. B horizon is very, very thick, mostly clay, and the parent material is very far down and usually heavily weathered. Okay, in the uh, tropical rainforest, the vegetation, okay, they're very diverse, both in species, composition, and in structure, okay? That means um, how they're built. Okay. Um, so this would be what the tropical rainforest, at least in many places, looks like at ground level. Okay. That's at ground level. We still have the tall canopy trees and all, and all the understory and all of that. Okay. This is why you want to carry a machete in the rainforest. You walk through that and it closes in behind you. Okay. It's hard to see your footprints because usually the ground is not exposed. It's like covered with leaves and things like that and you can't find your way. Now in an area where it's more flooded, Okay, and really wet, your footprints disappear quickly. The ground is really spongy. Okay, and you press down and this just comes back up and your footprints are gone. So it's hard to track yourself unless you leave a path of destruction behind you. My dad and I learned that the hard way. We decided we would go on a little hike. And if it hadn't been for the fact that we got to kind of a high point where we could hear the road and locate it and then walk towards it, we would have been lost because we didn't have a machete. We just walked in and it just closed in behind us and we couldn't see the sun, couldn't tell which way was north or south. It was really disorienting, okay? Um, now, there's up to eight different layers of vegetation. So you got your undergrowth, okay, like this. There'd be a couple of layers of undergrowth, the small undergrowth, the upper undergrowth. You have a few understory layers and then you have a few canopy layers on top of that, okay? Uh, and up to 100 different tree types per hectare. How big is a hectare? Uh, yeah, it's 100 meters by 100 meters. Okay, 
So roughly the area enclosed by the running track out back here would be about one hectare, it's probably a little less than one hectare, but it's around that, okay? There's not a hundred trees in there. There's a hundred different kinds of trees in an area that big, okay? Like we said, in the forest in Canada, you'd be lucky if there were a hundred trees in an area that big, Never mind a hundred different kinds of trees. So it's very, very diverse, okay? Most of the trees in the rainforest are evergreen. Okay, I don't mean pine or spruce like evergreen are up here. I just mean they never lose their leaves. There are no deciduous trees in the rainforest because if you lose your leaves and you're not carrying out photosynthesis, other things will outgrow you, shade you out, and kill you. Okay, that's very competitive for resources. Okay, and I think I showed you this as well before this picture, okay, where we had the roots that do the anchoring. That would be these ones. And then we have the snorkel roots, okay, that uh, absorb oxygen and allow the plant not to suffocate. Okay, animals in the tropical rainforest. Like we said, lots and lots of different kinds of bugs, okay? Like you got your like uh, dung beetles, okay? And your walking stick and your praying mantis. Uh, and then lots of lots of uh, like reptiles and amphibians, okay? Mostly amphibians, not so many reptiles, but lots of amphibians, frogs, many, many different species of frogs, okay? Including the ones where if you lick their back, you go crazy, okay? Not that any of you should ever do that because you could also get salmonella from doing that, okay? But apparently there are people out there that lick the backs of tree frogs because there's like a hallucinogen that they secrete that makes animals not want to eat them. Well, they are poisonous. That's why you don't want to eat them, okay? But they're poisonous because they secrete this hallucinogen that, yeah. So you shouldn't do that. I've just, I've seen like videos of people do that and I'm like, that's just blah. Don't lick that frog. And uh, you got like small mammals, okay? There's not a large, lot of large animals in the rainforest, why? It's hard to move around, yeah. And with it being flooded all the time, you can't be an animal that lives on the ground or especially under the ground. You cannot be a subterranean animal. Gophers don't do well, okay, in the rainforest unless they have scuba gear, okay? Yeah, they're more savannah, yeah. Okay, uh, so we, most of the larger animals and a lot of the insects and stuff are what we call arboreal. They live in the trees. They spend their whole lives in the trees. Okay, one of the largest animals in the tropical rainforest would be the three-toed sloth. Okay, they're the ones that have that kind of creepy looking face with the big eyes and the really small mouth. Okay, um, and they are the slowest mammal because they don't have to be fast. They have like, on their, on their toes, they have toenails that look like a coat hanger and they just hook over top of branches and they just hang there, okay? They just hang out and every once in a while they get hungry, they reach over and grab a leaf and eat it, okay? Uh, and they sh kind of shimmy along on the, on the branches as opposed to move on the ground, okay? You put a three-toed sloth on the ground and it's practically immobile, right? Its musculature is designed to scurry and hang as opposed to hold up its own weight on the ground like ours is, okay? Which is why they're so slow when they're on the ground. They're not real fast in the trees either, okay? But you put them on the ground and they're just not, I mean, look at how skinny their arms are. It's just not, their musculature isn't designed that way. It's designed to hold them this way. They have a strong back as opposed to a strong chest. I don't know, I never asked. I would assume so. I, I've honestly never had that question. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know is the answer to that one. The other part of that answer is I'm not going to look it up either. <laughs> okay. uh, another thing with a lot of animals and plants in the rainforest is this word here, endemic, which means they only live in one spot in that tropical rainforest which is why it's very easy to cause the extinction of plant or animal species through deforestation and development in the tropical rainforest. Because there could be, you know, this small flowering plant that only grows in this one spot. Okay, you deforest that spot, that species is extinct. Okay, so it, it is um, unique among biomes in that it's really the only one that has that. Okay. Um, yeah, and then obviously the arboreal thing, that would also, I would say, be pretty important. Okay, probably something I would mention in the description. Um, do you have to remember all these? <laughs> what do you mean? Like, we have to remember all the time to work with it. 
no, you have to remember them because I'm going to give you a picture and a description. You got to be able to identify, right? Okay, chemical cycling, like decomposition, things like that. It's really, really fast in the tropical rainforest. Okay, you can see kind of in the foreground of this picture, there's like a fallen log, right? I mean, if a tree falls in the forest here in Canada, it decays and decomposes for like 20 years. Okay, it takes forever for a tree to decompose here because it's constantly interrupted by a long, cold winter where the de decomposing organisms can't work on it. We don't have as many uh, insects and things like that to help break it down, uh, you know, mosses, molds, bacteria, okay, that kind of stuff to break it down. Whereas in the tropical rainforest, there's way more of that and the conditions are right 12 months of the year for them to work. So something can be decomposed within a matter of weeks in the tropical rainforest, uh, especially with the number of bugs. Things like uh, like ants and termites and stuff like that are very active in those kind of climates. Okay, um, other things. Food chains are long and complex. Okay, because there are so many insects, okay, you would have a food chain that would be like your your producers, so any plant, and then the bug that eats the plant, and the bug that eats that bug, and the bugs that eat the bug that eats the bug, and the bug that eats the bug that eats the bug that eats the bug, that eats the bug and blah, 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 blah. The food chains get really, really long, okay, because there are so many different kinds of insects, and then you'd have maybe, uh, you know, a, a mammal at the top of that that's an in, in insectivore, okay, that eats bugs, right? But most of your large mammals are not predators in, in the tropical rainforest. Most of them are herbivores. Okay, so the, there's not a lot of kind of top carnivore type organisms in the tropical rainforest. Isn't there like things like some flies that there's like Yeah. I mean, in the oceans around there, there are. But in the in the tropical rainforest, no, there are not a lot of apex predators, which is why there's so much life, right? Oh, there's like not... The right, like the savanna is very different. It's the exact opposite. It's like wildebeest, lion, and a food chain, right? So you got, you know, your, your first order consumer that eats the grass and the thing that eats it is the top carnivore and you're done. Okay. But remember, there's big herds of those kind of things there too. It's just different. Okay. The savanna. Next one. Okay. The savanna is basically a tropical grassland. Okay. A tropical prairie, if you like. Um, they usually fringe on the rainforest. They're kind of a transition between them. Okay. Um, so it is definitely referred to as a grassland biome, but Okay, uh, tropical. Okay, it can also be an open woodland in many cases. So you'll get, you know, clumps of trees grouped together where maybe there's a spring, okay, or something like that where there's just a little bit more water, or for some reason soil has become more dense or nutrient dense there. Okay, and so you'll get places almost like an oasis in the desert, okay, where there'll be some trees. Now the trees generally all have the same shape, like an umbrella. Okay, they have basically nothing growing on the bottom, and then this canopy that they make. Okay, this one as well, you can see there's basically nothing on the bottom, but it's got a flat, almost umbrella shape. Okay, same with this one. Okay, they're an umbrella shape. These ones aren't, you know, perfectly umbrella, but you can see they're generally flat on the bottom, and they spread their foliage out after that. What's the advantage of doing that? Okay, more, photo, more photosynthetic surface area. What else? Right. Only giraffes can eat their leaves. That's why giraffes have evolved long necks. Okay. Most of the rest of the predator, or, um, um, herbivores have to eat the grass. So it keeps them that way. Okay. One other one. Okay. Uh, not so much that it gets more rain when it rains, but it can shade its roots and keep the moisture there. Okay. Um, Cause obviously they don't absorb the rain through the leaves. They absorb it through the roots. But with that canopy, that umbrella shape, it basically makes shade over its roots all the time, especially important during the eight months of dryness okay, that the savanna might get. All right. So for the climate, we can see that the temperature line on their climatogram is very similar to the tropical rainforest. It's flat. It's a little higher. Okay? It's generally a little warmer okay, in, the, in the savanna because they get more direct sunshine. Um, and then look at the, the rainfall. There are some months where they get 35 centimeters of rain. Okay, so this is this would be the monsoon season here. Okay, these four months here would be the monsoon season. So January, okay, would be you know fairly wet. It's about 100 and 140 millimeters of rain, so 14 centimeters. Okay, then we start getting over 200, over 300 for a couple of months, and then it just falls off, right? And it's dry with basically no precipitation. Okay, for four to six months, depending on where you are. Okay, um, so 
essentially we'll get some open some some woodlands but nothing dense like the tropical rainforest most of it will be prairie okay uh, so we have a distinct dry season that would be something that would be important in case if we're looking for that on a climatogram plants will estivate they'll become dormant okay so they'll use what uh, what plant hormone was that it caused plants to go dormant Abscisic acid, good. All right, uh, so they'll use that, yeah, and they'll go dormant, but they're not going dormant because it gets cold. They're getting dormant because it gets hot and dry, and there's no no water. Okay, um, precipitation is variable, but there is the monsoon season. Okay, um, there's lots of wildfires. Some of them human caused, but obviously some can be naturally caused by lightning and things like that as well. Um, that can really change the look of the savanna periodically. And many of the plants in the savanna are actually fire resistant. Okay? They've grown and evolved and adapted to being able to have their foliage burned off, but not have the core of the plant burn. The eucalyptus tree is an example of that. Okay? It can actually be scorched and it'll grow back. Right? Its bark is dense, or sorry, it's not dense, is uh, thick, but almost spongy, so it acts like insulation. So while the outside bark can burn and get very hot, the inner bark doesn't burn. Okay, it protects itself from that. So, okay, there are some plants that have evolved ways to do that. What's this cheetah sitting on? Uh, not ants, termite mound. Yeah, okay, that mound is made of sawdust, which is termite poop. Okay, there are tons and tons of termites and in like um, insects in the savanna that break down plant material. Because there's a lot of plant material. There's grasses and things like that, but there's also trees. Okay? And when termites get into something and they get you get an infestation of termites, they can turn anything into sawdust in pretty short order. Okay? And they make these big giant mounds. Like it's like a giant anthill except there's termites inside instead. All right. Um, so like we said, many of the trees in the savanna are fire resistant, okay? The action of fire and voracious appetites of termites, seeds rarely survive. They eat anything that is plant material. So when a plant makes seeds and they fall on the ground, insects eat them. So they have, so the plants in that area have to produce unfathomable amounts of seeds just so that a few will survive, okay? Um, lots of savanna trees are zero fights. We talked about zero fights in the biology unit. That means they can survive long periods of drought. Okay. Um, they have a, a real ability to uptake water quickly when it's available and then hold it uh, during the dry periods. Deep roots and flattened crowns. Some will shed their leaves. Okay. Um, they're often stunted. Okay. So even though they have that umbrella shape, the top of the tree isn't all that tall. It's just that the canopy or the part of it that's underneath is high enough off the ground that it can't be eaten. Um, and then there's this stuff, African elephant grass. This is a picture of it. I had a student who was from South Africa um, a few uh, few years ago, and he sent me that picture. You can't see his house. Okay. He said, yeah, because I was teaching this lesson. He's like, oh, yeah, we have that stuff, and it grows around our, our like summer house. And we, we, when we go there, we have to cut it all down so we can get into the house. It over, it grows taller than the house, okay? It's called elephant grass because elephants can walk through it and be invisible. It's that tall, okay? It's almost like bamboo, he said. Like, it's hard, it's not like grass here. Like, because our grass can't get that tall, falls over, okay? This stuff is thicker, okay? And can withstand, like, wind and things like that and get really, really, really tall, all right? Um, of course, that much plant material then can support large herds of herbivorous animals like elephants and, and wildebeests and, and things like that. Okay, so there's lots of long grasses and some short grasses depending on how dry the area is. Okay, savanna soils are variable, but for the most part, they have a really thick topsoil. This is all topsoil here. Okay, that is like three feet worth of topsoil because every year the grasses go dormant, okay, and new grass grows up, so all of that blades, all the blades and thatch and whatever else decompose and build up this layer of, of thick, thick uh, A horizon. Okay. All right, the animals. 
Diversity is the opposite of the tropical rainforest. In the rainforest, diversity was high. In the savanna, it's low. Food chains are very short. Okay? If you have food chains involving insects, the insects eat the plants, and then there's an insectivore that eats the insects, and then a top carnivore that eats that. So you'd have like the anteaters and the aardvarks and things like that. Okay? Um, and then you'd have your kind of normal food chain where it would be a large herbivore, a mammal, okay, that's eaten by the top carnivore. Right? So we have very, very short food chains in the savanna. And there's lots of decomposers, okay, like buzzards, okay, that would feed on the remains of whatever the lions kill and things like that. Okay, chemical cycling is pretty fast, not as fast as the tropical rainforest, because obviously there is a period where it is hot and dry, and that can slow the activity of decomposing organisms like um, fungus and bacteria and things like that. Okay. There are lots of sudden intense storms. This is what the savanna can look like in some places right after the monsoon season. There is going to be flooding. When you are getting 35 centimeters of rain in a month, okay, well, you're looking at a fair amount of water every day. Okay. It's like over an inch and a half of rain per day okay, for, uh, for the entire month, right? Like it's ridiculous. Okay. Sorry, no, my math isn't right on that. Sorry, it's like a centimeter and a half, not an inch and a half, a centimeter and a half of rain, okay, per day, right? So that much rain per day, right? When we get that much rain in a day, it, like, it's it's a big deal. Like, that's a severe thunderstorm where, you know, the, the gutters were full up to the sidewalk and things like that. They get that every day for a, for a couple of months. Okay, in the deserts, there's different kinds of desert, okay? This would be like a North American desert. And in the North American desert, you can get summer and winter and fall and whatever else, okay? There would be seasonality to this desert. An equatorial desert like the Sahara, no seasonality, just hot and dry all the time, okay? Like if, you know, like in Tunisia where they always film all the Star Wars movies, okay? That's just a hot, sandy, dry desert. But that, that's what we all envision as a desert, but in actual fact, most deserts don't look like that. Most deserts are actually a little rockier than that. Okay, the shifting sands, okay, of Tatooine and uh, you know places like that are not like, okay, are not like most deserts. Okay, so um, they support widespread but relatively sparse vegetation. So there are plants that live in the desert, but it's not like the rainforest. They're not packed close together. Okay, they're very spread out because they can't share resources. There's not enough to go around. Okay. Arid and semi-arid land covers almost one third of the globe in terms of land surface. Okay, that's a lot. That's way more than like the prairie and the deciduous forest put together. Okay. Now, climatogram for a desert. The temperature line can vary. Okay, we're seeing here that this is a hot desert. So this would be more of an equatorial desert. Okay, the lowest temperature is 24. The highest temperature is like 35. Okay, so is there a lot of fluctuation? No. Okay, Thir 24 to 35 is not a lot of fluctuation. I know it kind of looks like there's a bit of a bell curve here, but you got to remember the scale is misleading. Okay, if this was, you know, a temperature scale that included um, the negatives, you would hardly see any change at all. It would be almost a flat line. Okay, so a hot equatorial, equatorial desert would have a fairly flat line. A more um, high latitude desert would have a bell curve. But what do both deserts have in common? Right, look down here at the precipitation. It's going to be really low. Okay, your wettest month in the desert, okay, you can see here millimeters of precipitation, the wettest month was about just under 60 millimeters. Okay, that's six centimeters of rain in a month. That's the wettest month. Okay, and there's some months where it's zero. Okay, so that's what you got to look for. All deserts will have low precipitation. Okay, the temperature line can be misleading, okay, but they will all have at least that in common. Okay. Okay, so vegetation is going to be short perennial grasses. That's grasses that grow back every year, not annual grasses. Okay, thorny, scrubby things, okay, like, a, like brush and cacti and stuff like that. Okay, plants have to be able to survive long periods of drought, so they're xerophytic. Okay, they have all kinds of adaptations to do so. The saguaro cactus develops a widely spreading root system. Mesquite has deep roots. Okay, um, 
they'll store water and stems and leaves, okay, things like that, or their leaves will be absent and they'll develop into thorns to protect them from being grazed on, okay, things like that. So they are, I mean, you can see here, look at how far the spacing between all of the plants. Okay, they have to space themselves like that because there's just not enough water. If another plant tries to grow close to this one, they may both die, right? They simply, there's not enough water to share. So you're gonna see more spacing of the plants. Is light a limiting factor in the desert? Never, okay? I mean, there's not, you can't shade out your buddy because they're not gonna grow very close, right? Okay, it's whether can you get more water. Okay? That's always the limiting factor there. Okay, soils associated with deserts tend to be um, wet, like little weathered. That means there's gonna be big chunks of rock. Okay, so there's gonna be lots of rock hanging around on the surface because topsoil never builds up. It's too dry, okay? If a plant dies, its leaf litter and material doesn't stay there. It dries up and blows away. And okay, so it doesn't get a chance to develop that organic layer of topsoil that you would see in other places. So the A horizon is thin to absent, okay? The B horizon, it's gonna have some clay, but it's gonna be gravelly, okay? Gravelly and rocky as opposed to, or sandy in some places, okay? Uh, and then the C horizon, you're gonna find that the parent material is again like gravel, okay? Not, not large rocks or bedrock, but gravel. Okay, solanetic soils, that means that the soils tend to be salty. Again, if all the water evaporates out of them, what gets left on the surface is all the minerals. And that of course makes it even harder for plants to grow because it upsets their osmotic balance. Okay, the animals that live there, okay. Um, in deserts, um, there's more diversity than you might think. There's gonna be lots of bugs, okay. Lots of bugs are able to survive in that in those conditions because they have that hard outer carapace, okay, that doesn't allow the evaporation of a lot of water. So scorpions and things like that are very well adapted to the desert. Um, lizards, okay, reptiles are adapted to the desert. They have that thick scaly skin, okay. They also have, they also lay leathery eggs that don't require them to be in water, okay. So they can adapt and, and uh, survive in the desert. Um, and then you're gonna have rodents, okay? You're not gonna usually have a lot of large animals, maybe a fox but or a coyote maybe in some conditions, but uh, for the most part, large mammals are gonna be absent because they require too much what? Well, not so much food, water, yeah, okay? It's just too hard to have to be very large and survive in the desert. Obviously there are exceptions, camels, okay? Camels are the exception. Um, how does a camel's hump work? That's what everybody thinks, it's like this big bucket, um, but it's not. Um, it, there is a lot of fluid in the camel's hump, but a camel's hump is like scar tissue. It's very hard, but full of fluid, but it's not like, like I say, like a bucket. It's this, um, this tissue that's full of water, but hard and scaly kind of. Um, and so what can happen is there's blood vessels that flow through that, so the hump, actually acts like a heat sink for the for the camel. So um, it's almost like the hump of the camel runs a fever, so the rest of the camel's body can be cooler, okay? It's got what's called a counter current exchange system of blood vessels. We have the same thing in our hands, but not for warmth, for cold, okay? As soon as we start to get cold, what's the first thing in your body that gets cold? Hands and feet, right? Because what does your, your body do? It cuts the circulation off to those to your extremities. So you've got warm blood that's flowing past cold blood coming back, right? So we, your, your warm blood loses energy to the cold blood, which is going back to your heart. Everyone follow? Okay, and that prevents a lot of heat loss from your extremities. Well, with camels, it kind of works the opposite way. Okay, warm blood goes into the hump and, and the heat is absorbed by that scar tissue and then the blood going back into the camel is cooler. Okay, that allows them to maintain body temperature without having to sweat. Okay. Now a camel does sweat a little bit. Okay, they also spit a lot. They're really ornery animals. Okay, um, but they do conserve water very well in those conditions. Okay, but not a lot of large animals can survive in the desert. Okay, there's a reason you don't see people riding horses in the desert. They ride camels instead. Because okay. a horse. Anyone ever ridden a horse when you ride it hard? They sweat. Okay, and they can sweat quite a bit actually. So they wouldn't do well in a really, really dry place. Okay, um, small rodents though, they can do pretty well because they don't sweat typically. Okay, uh, a rabbit like that, and that picture is good because you can see the blood vessels in its ear. Okay, um, when we get hot, what happens to our face? 
Really? Mine doesn't get itchy. <laughs> it gets red, right? We get we get flushed. Why does it get red? Right. Blood rushes to the surface. The little capillaries near the surface of your skin fill with blood. And then when you sweat, the heat is taken from that blood in those small capillaries, and it's more efficient to lose heat that way. When we start to get cold, we get pale because those blood vessels close off, okay? And so we don't look that way. Well, with a, with a, a rabbit, okay, what they do is they'll allow blood into those blood vessels, and then they'll flap their ears, Okay? And it cools the blood in their ears, and it goes back into their body a little bit cooler. They don't have to use a lot of water to do that. They can just go in the shade and fan themselves a little bit and cool off their blood. Okay? So they don't have to sweat. Okay? They also don't have to pant. Okay? You're, if you have like a cat or a dog at home, that they cool themselves by panting. Right? And when they pant, what's happening is they're allowing water to evaporate off the inside of their throat, which is right next to your carotid artery. That's the one that supplies blood to the brain. So they're cooling the blood that goes to the brain, okay? And that makes them feel cooler that way, but it doesn't use as much water. Okay, so basically you gotta be small or you gotta be nocturnal as an animal, okay? If you only come out at night, it's a lot cooler at night in the desert, so okay, you can do better. But then of course you have to be adapted to be able to see in the dark. Okay, chemical cycling. It basically doesn't happen. It's too dry. You have to have water for things to decompose. Otherwise, they just desiccate, that is dry out, and lay there forever. Right. Hey, the grasslands. Does that look like a prairie? Looks like a desert, doesn't it? There's like, uh, actually not far off, it's uh, by Empress, which is just north of Medicine Hat. Hey, um, you can see there's like prickly pear cactus and stuff all around that place. Okay. The temperate grassland can be very dry. Deserts and grasslands border on each other. So grasslands can be uh, can be quite dry in some cases, especially if you're down, you know, by, by Medicine Hat, that kind of area. Okay. It's pretty dry there. The prairie there looks a lot different than the prairie up here. Our grasses tend to be longer because we get more precipitation than they do. Okay. So there's different kinds. Okay. There's long grass prairie, short grass prairie, mixed grass prairie. Okay. There's, it just depends on the amount of rain. Okay. What they all have in common, lots of grasses, not a lot of trees. Okay. All right. So it only occupies 7% of the earth's total land surface, but that's where the majority of our food is grown. Okay. So it's an important agricultural zone. Okay. Since we live in this biome, okay, we should be pretty familiar with the weather. Obviously, these are not equatorial climates. So we got a bell curve on our climatogram, okay, showing that it's either mid to high latitude. And for at least the prairie, precipitation follows temperature. Okay. Our wettest months are also the warmest months because that's when the water cycle is most effective. Okay. Right now, is the water cycle doing very much? Well, actually, last year, the water cycle in the winter was more active because it was warmer. Right now, the water cycle is stalled. There's not much water evaporating outside right now, right? That kind of stalls the water cycle and doesn't allow things like, like we're not producing a lot of latent heat around here right now, right? We're not getting a lot of water vapor into the air, okay? The only precipitation we're getting is coming from the south, okay? If you've watched, like, you might want to do this sometime. Whenever we get a snowfall warning, click on that view map thing that's right underneath the snowfall warning on your phone, and you can see almost all of our snowstorms come up from the southwest, okay? They come up from the southwest. Now, once in a while, we get one that moves in from the north, but for the bulk, for the most part, they come up over the mountains that way. Okay, so right now it's just too cold for us to really generate that kind of a uh, of of weather or wetness. Okay, because the water cycle tends to stall. Okay, when it gets cold, that's why typically the winter months show less precipitation. Okay, obviously June, especially in Calgary, okay, is the wettest month. Okay, and it's the wettest month by a considerable margin. Okay, why? What happens in June? Yes, that's what it is. It has to do with the runoff, okay? That's when all the snow is melting. As the snow melts, the rivers swell, okay? Uh, the, the wetlands on either side of the river begin to absorb that water, and now there's more water available for evaporation, and the days are longest, so there's more solar radiation to put water vapor into the air from those areas where it's being held. So yes, our precipitation does have a lot to do with the fact that runoff typically happens during that month. 
Okay, uh, vegetation. So you can see here, here's two different kinds of prairie in Alberta. This is by Empress, just north of Medicine Hat. Okay, so very southern Alberta. Short grass prairie. This is taken first week of August. So it's already burnt. Okay, it's already dormant and done. This is taken second week of August in St. Paul. Okay, which is northwest, or sorry, northeast of, uh, of Edmonton. Okay, still green. Grass is longer. There's trees around occasionally. Okay, whereas short grass prairie is just cooked. All right, so they still have similarities. They're very grassy, okay? The types of animals that would live there are gonna be very similar. You're gonna have deer, okay, uh, things like that. Um, but obviously their structure in terms of plants is a bit different. Okay, um, soils, thick A horizons, because obviously every year the, the grass dies and new blades grow in the spring. So the old blades of grass and roots get decomposed and added to that organic layer. All right. Fauna means animals. What's wrong with this picture? There's no animals in it. It's a picture of a cow eating grass. Right? Um, now, why am I showing you a picture with no animals in it on the slide about animals? Yep. The animals that live or lived on the prairie naturally no longer live on the prairie, at least here. Okay. In historical times, what was the biggest animal on the prairie? Buffalo and bison, okay? They are basically absent, okay? They only are now located in national parks, protected areas, or people's farms that are farming them for food, okay? They are basically gone from the wild, okay, uh, for all intents and purposes. Why? Well, we hunted them. That didn't help, okay? But, I mean... You know, the, the natives, they, hunt, they hunted them for years. Of course, they didn't take nearly as many because it's a lot harder to kill buffalo when you're running them off a cliff to do it. Okay. And that was how they hunted them, right? Okay. Because, um, I mean, people have this image of like natives shooting them with bows and arrows and stuff, which was not, okay, not how they did that. You can't, you'd have to fill a buffalo up with a lot of arrows before you take it down. Okay. They're big and thick. Um, the best way to take them out would either be like a large spear where you could stab deeply, but then you have to be close. And that's dangerous, okay? Buffalo are big and aggressive, but they're dumb. And where are their eyes? Right, that's why you can run them off a cliff, okay? All you have to do is be on the sides of the herd and their attention is to the sides. You can then get people behind that force them to run and they don't see the cliff coming because they got a blind spot in the front. So you run right off the cliff. And the ones behind, follow the ones in front, okay? Like I said, they're not the brightest, okay? But if you give them a chance to look, okay, then you're in trouble because then they'll charge you, okay? And you can get trampled, all right? So hunting buffalo, hunting buffalo was a lot different before the rifle. That made it a lot easier. It kind of took the sport out of it, okay? Um, and obviously, yes, we did kill off a lot of them. But what killed them off more than that was the barbed wire fence. And not that a buffalo can't run right through a barbed wire fence if they want to, because they can. I've, if you ever watch, like, you spook a cow, they'll go right through it too, okay? Um, but they're migratory and they're lazy. So big herds of thousands of bison and buffalo would just walk along the province, eat up all the grass, and then just keep walking. But when people started fencing areas off and building structures and things like that, it created obstacles and the, the bison would just walk along the fences and starve. They'd eat up all the grass and then just kind of go, well, I can't move now. Okay. And yeah, okay. So the other problem with them, they were a competitor for cattle. Cattle are easier to manage, okay? Buffalo are not easy to manage. Okay, when you have like a herd of buffalo that you're raising like cattle, okay, you have to build different fences. You have to manage them differently okay, than you do with cattle because cattle are dumb. They're even dumber than buffalo. Okay, um, and you know, just believe me, look into the eyes of a cow. Okay? There's just really nothing there. Okay, um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're happy to just stay in the pen that you put them in. Okay, or bison, not always. Okay, and so it was easier to manage cattle. Well, if the cattle and the bison are competing for the same resources, you got to get rid of the competitor. Okay? And that's essentially what happened. They just, it was, they were too difficult to manage. All right, other things that are gone, okay? There's still deer around, but not nearly as many as there used to be, okay? But the top predators are also gone. 
Why are the predators gone? Uh, well, a little bit, but I mean, we replaced the bison with cattle. What do we not want the cattle to have happen to them? Be eaten. So we killed them all. Okay. There's no bears on the prairie anymore. There used to be. Okay. But we killed them off because they would eat our cattle. Okay. And our chickens and whatever else. Okay. There's a lot of foxes are gone too. Okay. You hardly ever see foxes anymore. They're very rare. Okay. Um, and that's because, again, they would raid chicken coops and things like that. So we had to kill them off. Okay. Coyotes have managed to do okay because they're good gopher hunters. Okay. We keep them around for that reason. They typically just keep to themselves and eat lots of gophers, which are a pest anyway. Okay. Uh, so they've done all right. Wolves, they're gone. Because wolves aren't happy to just eat gophers. If they can take down something bigger, they will. And they hunt, they hunt in packs, so they can take down a cow okay, or something like that. Uh, so we've eliminated the top predators. They're essentially gone from there as well, okay? which has allowed the smaller animals, gophers and things like that, to really you know, go places and coyotes to, to have an explosion as well. OK. Um, Chemical cycles. Chemical cycling happens reasonably rapidly in the prairie, but remember, there's a long winter that slows that down. Okay, it's not like the tropical rainforest. Okay, but it does happen. Uh, the concern we have is in artificial parts of the of the prairie, like where we have maybe like feedlots, or if we've used a lot of commercial fertilizer or something like that, runoff can get into bodies of water and those fertilizers can then cause the overgrowth of algae, which can make the water toxic. So it is something that we have to watch on the prairie because water sources are valuable and rare. I'll accept either one. Okay, temperate, deciduous, broadleaf, sclerophyllous forest biomes. Trees that lose their leaves. Trees that lose their leaves, okay? That's, that's the kind of biome we're looking at here, okay? Uh, about 9% of the Earth's land surface. Thick soils here because every year there's that huge input of leaf litter. Okay, but to get a forest, you have to have steady what? Steady precipitation, right? Okay, so when we're looking at the climate here, yeah, we get a bell curve on temperature because typically these are higher latitude biomes. But when you look at the precipitation, it's not that it's huge, right? There's no months that are ridiculously wet. 70 millimeters of rain is not an overly wet month, okay? But the driest month is 40, okay? So there's steady rainfall all year long, not like on the prairie, okay, where the lines, you know, some of them were almost nil, okay, and a couple of them were really, really tall, okay? So steady, not just rainfall, but there could also be snowfall, just steady supply of precipitation throughout the year, okay? So no extended dry periods. Winters are shorter. Okay, temperate forests are similar to tropical rainforests in structure. There's undergrowth, understory, and canopy, just not as many layers, okay? And it's not as dense, okay? It's more dense than, than a, a taiga forest, which we'll talk about in a minute, okay? But nothing like the tropical rainforest, okay? Uh, we're gonna have more humidity there, okay? And we're gonna have things like um, the broad, sorry, the broadleaf evergreen temperate forests, okay, that are in more humid zones are going to have things like oak, magnolias, and even palms, okay. Um, but temperate forests have oak, beech, hickory, uh, maple, okay, hazel, sycamore, things like that. So these would be like North American temperate forests, okay, because North America would be temperate, okay. Uh, the temperate forests that are broadleaf and evergreen, that would be more like what you would see on the west coast of BC. Okay, that would be a temperate rainforest almost. Okay, uh, so more humid, and they're going to have different types of trees. Sclerophyllous forest biomes, that's the chaparral, that's the Mediterranean climate. Okay, that's going to be drought tolerant species like olive and pine. Okay. What do they all have in common? They're all deciduous. Even, even some species of pine and spruce are deciduous. We have deciduous um, spruce here, okay? They're called larch, all right? And if you go into Kananaskis in like uh, mid to late September, it looks like some of the trees are like on fire almost. They've got this bright orange color to them because they're actually losing their leaves or losing their needles, okay? There are deciduous species of spruce and pine. Yes, more diversity in the, in the um, deciduous forest than in the tega, yeah. And the tega is evergreen. Okay, we don't have a lot of plants there that lose their leaves, sorry. Okay, uh, so 
usually get uh, soils that have a lot of leaf litter. Okay, you're going to have lots of earthworms and things like that uh, because the soil is going to be loose and easy to turn over. Okay, the animals. Okay, you're going to get bigger animals in the in the um, deciduous forest because there's more food available, there's more cover and shelter. Okay, so you'll have more apex predators, wolves, uh, lynx. Obviously, are quite endangered because people like their fur. Um, foxes and weasels do pretty well here. There are going to be subterranean animals because it's not so wet that the soil gets flooded. Okay, and you'll have big herbivores, moose and elk, okay, living in those kind of places. Okay, uh, there's lots, also going to be a lot of tree-dwelling animals, so squirrels okay, and stuff like that. Okay, and chemical cycling happens reasonably rapidly. Winters are mild and short. There's lots of water and there's shade. Okay, and that's important for decomposing because it stays moist near the near the forest floor. So in this biome, nutrient cycling is going to be more rapid than on the prairie for sure. Okay, the tega. So with the tega, we've got, okay, this would be like a picture, you know, typical like Canmore, Banff kind of an area, just tons and tons of spruce, okay, which means full of lumber, okay, it's a high, high resource type of biome. Typically, this is where we'll find deposits of coal and deposits of oil and gas as well, okay, um, especially oil sands, that kind of thing, because they're typically associated with uh, bogs and, and, uh, and things like that. Okay, uh, so relatively undisturbed by man because most of them are quite remote. Okay, I mean you look at where they were; it was like Russia slash Siberia. Uh, okay, that kind of area, uh, very northern Canada. It's just it's a it's a tough area to be. Okay, um, wildfires are very common. Obviously, we saw that last year. Okay, the Tega can get very dry. Okay, a lot of this when the snow falls in the Tega, not a lot of it falls. But the problem is, is that the tega is very cold, but warms up quickly. Well, what that means is the snow melts, but the soil doesn't thaw. So what happens to all the water? It just runs off. It doesn't get absorbed. Okay. And then if you get a dry spring, the plants have nothing because there was no soil or no water in the soil because the rains haven't come yet. The runoff just ran off. Okay. And so it's very dangerous to have, um, or very common, sorry, to have wildfires in that area. And obviously we saw that last year, huge tracts of the, of the forest were burned. Now, part of that was because it was just time. Okay. In the Tega, there's obviously like a fire kind of cycle. Okay. And as the forest matures and ages, it becomes sick and the, some of the plants start to die and they just become fuel and they sit there for ages and ages. And all it takes is just a, a, you know, a spring and a winter like we had last year to just get them going. Right. Um, now that the, now that that wildfire has happened, new growth will occur because now those pine cones will open up. Okay. They've been burnt and the, the seeds will be dispersed and new forest will grow. So while it was obviously tragic because a lot of people lost their homes and, and things like that, it's just something that does happen naturally in the Tega. It's supposed to, it's supposed to do that every once in a while. And that was a problem that um, Parks Canada had for the longest time. They were preventing fires in the parks for a very long time, not realizing they were just setting the stage for a massive burn because they just, they would put them out right away. They would, you know, um, bulldoze areas so the fire couldn't spread. And they just left those areas where the fire didn't go full of fuel. Okay. Eventually something's going to happen that they can't contain. Okay. And that happened in 2003. Okay. I was actually backpacking in Jasper and we got redirected. Okay. We said, you can't go over, like we were hiking through the smoke. Okay. And they were just like, you can't, you can't go out that way. The fire is burning there right now. You have to go back. Okay. Incidentally, that's why you always carry at least one extra day of meals when you are backpacking. Okay. Okay. Looking at the climatogram, what do you see about the precipitation? It's low. Okay. We're getting a forest here, but it's not a lush forest. Okay. Spruce forests, pine forests typically are a lot drier. Okay. So we get a little bit of precipitation that peaks in late summer and fall. Okay. And some of that is going to be snow. Right, because obviously winter can persist. Okay, for 50 to 70 percent of the year, um, and the temperature fluctuates wildly. So you are going to see a very steep bell curve for the Tega. Okay, where the upper part of it could be 25 to 30 degrees, the lower part of it could be minus 40. 
Okay, so it's probably the biome that has the greatest change between summer and winter. And that's really what limits the kind of plants that can grow there. That's why basically in the Tega, there's like four or five different kinds of trees and that's it. Very few plants can tolerate a swing in temperature like that. Okay. All right. Okay, vegetation, not diverse at all. We already kind of covered that. There's lichens, black spruce, white spruce, larch, short grasses, Engelmann spruce, Douglas fir, okay, things like that. Um, and again, we said plants have to be drought tolerant because snow serves as the main source of water. Okay, soils in the Tega are cold. They're often referred to as cryosolic. Cryo means frozen because these soils tend to have almost permafrost kind of characteristics. Okay? They aren't frozen all year, but they're frozen eight, nine months of the year, which doesn't leave a long growing season okay, for the plants that grow there. Okay, animals. Animals are of two types. Supranivian, that means they live above the snow, or subnivian, they live below the snow. Sorry, third type, migrating. Okay, so I'm just leave. All right. Um, if you are supranivian, then you probably are active most of the year, including in the wintertime. You may have adaptations like a changing coat, okay? Like the Arctic fox, okay, Arctic hare, they have a summer coat and they have a winter coat, right? Their winter coat is white and their summer coat is dark. Um, uh, so they may have adaptations like that. And the coats are not just different colors, they're different structure, okay? The winter coat tends to be kind of downier and traps more, more uh, air and is a better insulator than the summer coat is, okay? Uh, if you are subnivian, then you often go dormant. Okay, gophers, squirrels, um, gophers in our area actually do this as well. Okay, they, when they go dormant in the wintertime, they actually will like lower their heart rate to a couple of beats per minute. Okay, breathe maybe once per minute, minute and a half. Okay, if you were to pick one up, it would seem like it was dead because it would be like cold and stiff. Okay, when you pick it up, when they're in their truly dormant state. This is a true hibernator. Okay, their metabolism slows and they are almost like dead, okay? But they use very little energy. They wake up periodically throughout the winter, okay? And when they first wake up, they do nothing but shiver, okay? Because they have to get their body temperature back up, okay? Then they walk around, they eat the seeds that they stored through the summer, and then they go back into hibernation again, okay? Bears are not true hibernators in that they don't lower their metabolism. They lay around and sleep a lot, okay? But they don't lower their metabolism a whole lot, okay? Um, Animals that are subnivian take advantage of the insulating effect of snow, okay? Um, if snow is like full of air and not packed, it can be a really good insulator. It'd be minus 40 outside, but they can get it above zero inside. We talked about the Quincy okay, there before Christmas because it reflects the light, but snow is also a good insulator because it traps air, prevents convection, okay? A lot of animals take care of the, or take advantage of that. If the snow gets packed, it's useless. Once it's packed, the air is forced out and there's no longer air spaces, so it gets really cold and doesn't act as an insulator anymore. Okay. All right, uh, what's this animal? It's a wolverine, yeah. Okay. They're pretty rare because they have really nice fur okay, and have been trapped um, to the point of endangerment, but um, they are an aggressive predator. Imagine all the intensity and anger of a grizzly bear concentrated into something the size of a German shepherd. Okay, that's a wolverine. Okay, there's a reason the superhero is mean and angry. That's because that's what wolverines are. Okay, mean and angry. No, I would imagine it did not. Like he got his arm chewed off. Uh, his hand was pretty messed up. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you don't, they're, they're not a, a lap dog. Yeah, leave them alone. Give them a lot of space. Okay, uh, they are an aggressive predator. They're going to eat, you know, small rodents, things like that. But they can also take down large animals, okay, because they're fast and they're just intense, okay? Like if they, they get, get on something, they're going to they're gonna go hard. They're very intense. Um, they might. If they could dig them up. The problem is, is it's difficult to sense an animal in hibernation because their metabolism is so low, they're not putting off much of an odor and they're not putting off much heat. So the senses they would be using to hunt them would be less effective to do so. Now, tracking visually, if they if they had come out and they were on the surface, they could follow their tracks. That's how they would hunt like a, a snowshoe hare 
things like that. But yeah, something in hibernation is a lot harder to hunt unless you know where the holes are. Okay, and then obviously the other tactic is migrate. Okay, geese and things like that are going to take off for the winter. Okay, other uh, super nivian animals would be moose. Okay, they have long legs, so they can, you know, yes, they don't walk on top of the snow, but they're long enough that they can walk through the snow. Okay, some animals like the snowshoe hare and arctic fox have big wide feet to disperse and spread out their weight so they can walk on top of the snow. Okay, so there's lots of adaptations to living in that area. Okay, chemical cycling, ridiculously slow, long cold winters, lack of moisture, lack of insects, okay, all make decomposition a uh, very, very slow affair. You're basically relying on fungus and moss and things like that to do it. Okay, and last one. Oh, I'm actually going to get done. Maybe. Okay, the, the tundra, okay, the tundra is the Arctic grassland and you can see there's not a lot of tall stuff. It all grows right along the surface and what do you see in the background there? Right here? Ice. This is the 6th of July. Okay, snow persists 12 months. Okay, soils are permafrost. That is, they are frozen. Maybe only the top couple of centimeters is actually going to thaw every year. Okay, so that pr really limits the kind of plants that can grow uh, in that area. So climatogram, again, steep bell curve. Okay, steep bell curve that doesn't go very high. Goes really far down into the negatives, but not very high into the positives. Okay, precipitation. Okay, this scale here, it's a lot like the, it's deceiving. It's a lot like the Tega, but the scale is different on this climatogram. Okay, when you're looking at precipitation, wettest month is about 60 millimeters of rain. Okay, and it's a little more spread out than it is on the prairie. Okay, but remember, this is going to be rain. The rest of it's going to be snow. Okay, most of the year the precipitation will follow snow. Okay, um, vegetation. Tundra actually means treeless. So you're going to see next to no trees, flat. If it's Arctic tundra, it's very flat. You can see things for a long way. Arctic or alpine tundra looks like this. When you're above the tree line, you're in the alpine tundra. Okay, you're above the tree line. It's too cold to grow tall trees because the soil is insufficient and frozen. I think I have like 10 seconds to spare. I got to do that two more times today. All right. Uh, so tomorrow we're going to go over uh, our unit review um, and Thursday will be your test.